We've been trying to cover lots of ground in some of the other historical things, and now we're going to really put something under, under the microscope. Um, so we're I'm very, very happy that Stephanie Breyer could join us uh, here finally in the Vector Hack. Please give a warm welcome to Stephanie Breyer. Thank you. So um, thank you so much for having me here. It's, it's a fantastic community and I'm very much looking forward to the, to the discussions afterwards. Um, please feel also free to, to interrupt and um, pose any questions that come up during my presentation. Um, I kind of consider this to, to, be a, um, to be a comedic screening because we will see three films in full length. Um, I have them listed here. They are not feature-length films, so they are all shorts, so it's going to be possible. And um, essentially, I, I structure my presentation in two parts, um, as you can see here. And I'm going to say a few things about, um, so to say, the, the electronic aspect and then about the cinematography aspect, because these are the two aspects that come together in these, in these films. Um, they are very much animated films that incorporate um, oscilloscopics. And um, then I chose these uh, three terms, space, abstraction, and sound. And it's important to note that all three of these play a role in all three um, films that I sh chose to show. But I'm, I'm going to sort it in a way so um, the first one is going to be more centered around space, and I explain this aspect with one film, and then a second one, abstraction, and the third um, on sound, to kind of give it a, um, a structure. Um, yeah, what is also, I think, quite important to note here is that there is no, no computing involved. So these um, circuits that were employed for creating the, the electronic images um, are kind of freewheeling. Mm, there is not really algorithmic operations that play a role here, so we will not talk about early computer graphics. I don't think that's a, an appropriate description. Okay, so where, where, does, um, where does my interest come from in, in these films? I was studying in Berlin Maybe you have heard of the Media Archaeology Collection at the Humboldt University. It's a private collection by one professor there, Wolfgang Ernst. And um, when I was uh, writing a, a student paper that was back in 2010, it was within that context. And there I focused on a comparison between the Braun tube, of which you see a operating... Um, like working model for educational purposes here on the upper right. So a comparison between that and a mechanical line rider, like this one here on the lower right. And um, I was, I was uh, focusing on the time base. So it, like the, the continuous movement of a drum in case of the line rider versus the, the staccato of a sawtooth signal driving the horizontal deflection of the um, electron beam of the tube. And as I did not only study media studies, um, but all, mainly actually art history, my um, art historical interest kicked in and I started looking at artworks. And the first thing that one finds when researching um, artworks in that context is Namjoon Pike. You see the Sen for TV on the left. And then I also found um, ben Laposki, but not so much information. And then I found mentionings of Mary Ellen Butte, but like no really useful or extensive information. And I also saw a mentioning of High Hirsch. Like, but these were just like, this exists, but nothing else. So I kind of put this note in the back of my mind to um, maybe, if I have time later, to do some more research on that. And then um, that occasion came up um, end of 2013 when I was then already um, in Basel and from early 2014 onward I'm, I've been working on a PhD thesis on these examples I just mentioned, 
Mary Ellen Butte, Hi Hirsch, Norman McLaren, and some others. And um, so I'm going to finish, I hope, beginning of next year. And then hopefully, I, I mean, we just turned in an application for a project on fluxes. And I will hopefully, if that works out, we will get to know in April, we'll do a, a sub-project on fluxes and electronic media. And some cases will be ASCO. Maybe you have heard of us company, Gert uh, Stern and Michael Callaghan. So that was happening on the West Coast, um, early 1960s onward. And then they moved to the East Coast and were very active and involved with the fluxus movement. So that might be my topic for the next years, hopefully. Let's see. So that's kind of my um, path within this realm to kind of historically look at the beginnings in the early 50s and maybe now I, I will move on to the 1960s. Um, but we even have to start um, earlier in, uh, <laughs> and uh, thanks to Bernhard for providing me the photo. We have to start earlier, um, actually in the 19th century and this moment that, that you kind of captured with that with that photo is um, a 19th century moment. So the, the interesting thing is um, that the measuring and visualizing of, um, of current just coming out of the, the wall, um, out of the socket, um, wasn't possible until 1897. So the network was established by then, but nobody had seen, so to say, um, a real-time visualization of the current coming out of the socket. And um, this paper by Ferdinand Braun from 1897 is um, kind of what, uh, what Bernhard showed in that, in that photo. And um, if you want to translate it to English, it would be on a method to demonstrate and study the, the sequence of variable currents. Um, and he did that by using a um, discharged um, tube, that means a tube with a, like almost a, a vacuum. Um, and um, yeah, I, th I think what, what is important to say here about that is that he combined existing, already existing elements. So um, the phosphorescent screen that, we, that is here, it's, um, that was integrated into the tube that already existed in other um, setups that were built earlier. Also the pinhole mask to focus the beam. And um, obviously the, the principle itself, the, the flow of an electron current within a discharge tube that was also around in the second half of the 19th century. But then what he added, and what is um, quite relevant to this setup, is a um, rotating mirror so he could uh, see um, a deflection um, of that spot on the translucent surface, um, on the phosphorescent uh, surface. And it's uh, qu um, quite interesting how um, he describes what he saw. He said it's uh, surprising how sinusoidal the, the shape is that he then uh, draw, drew out on paper. So I, I really like this description of a moment that came as a surprise to, to him. Um, and two years later, his assistant, Jonathan Zenek, so now we are in 1899, he kind of uh, shifted this principle of the external mirror and the drawing inside the tube by adding a second pair of coils to deflect the beam horizontally. So that is the, the sawtooth signal that he applied and the, um, the sweeping, um, which is very fundamental to how oscilloscopes still work today. Um, and this, this um, solution proved to be very elegant. And I mean, in general, the, this um, electronic process that doesn't involve any mechanical parts and where there is no time lag on, and no self oscillations is ideal for, for measuring and testing purposes because you get very accurate results. Um, what uh, Zenek also employed is photography, as we see here in his article. And by this he added another layer of objectivity, so to say. 
Um, and that makes this whole um, setup to be perfect for self-registration. And that is a very dominant uh, mode within 19th century experimental research, so that you, you don't intervene as a researcher, but you have the apparatus kind of do the recording and registration itself, kind of contained and automatic. And so the, we are now in the late 19th century, and it happened quite quickly in the 1920s, um, it was already an established tool. So it, it became, like, it, it shifted from being um, an object of research itself to um, becoming a tool that was used for other purposes. Um, okay, here we see an oscilloscope from the 1940s, but already in the 20s, the electronic oscilloscope was widely used for testing purposes in electrical engineering, and especially for high frequency measuring. And this is connected to the popularization of radio after the First World War. And um, radio required um, measuring and testing in the megahertz range. And the oscilloscope allowed for an instantaneous graphical display. And it didn't cause any noise in the circuits that were to be tested. And it was also robust and easy to transport by that time. So the cathode ray oscillograph, cathode ray oscillograph, um, as it was called at that time, and um, from 1935 onward, oscilloscope was employed at the assembly line, so for the assembling of electronic devices, for the control of modulation at radio stations, and other kinds of frequency measuring purposes in electrical engineering. Um, yeah, and I mean, it was around the same time, the 1930s, that um, television became fully electronic, both on the sending and receiving side. Um, yeah, and obvious, obviously, like, the, the aspects of transmission and scanning don't play a role here with the oscilloscope, but audiovisuality does, and that's where we move on now to the second part on um, the cinematography. So, what do I mean by this? I mean um, the whole optical mechanical process involved with cinema, with filmmaker m making, and uh, with these uh, specific films, especially um, the fact that they are tediously hand animated and edited. So, montage plays a big role in in this field, and it's um, I mean it's a basically fundamentally very different process from electronic imaging, but it was the um, working paradigm at the time in the, in the 50s. Um, so the second part now on cinematography is going to be more extensive, as I'll show the experimental films um, in full length. And I already mentioned that it's going to be a um, commented and contextualized screening, and it's an opportunity to show these and um, they are not readily available online. And um, these uh, three films, they share common features. So all three of them are from the early 1950s, from North America, so that includes the US and Canada. They employ electronic images obtained by filming the screen of the scope. But, and that's very important to note, the filmmakers were not focused on that, that was not why they made the films, like they didn't start with an interest in electronic images, they had other interests and the um, oscilloscope came as a tool, as a device that they integrated into a more complex process. And um, the filmmaking process was kind of the end in itself, so they are highly planned out, highly edited, and they are all um, abstract. Um, experimental film within a genre that is called visual music film. What is also um, shared by all three is that they are technologically um, intriguing um, and that has like two sides on the one hand, um, like especially the one by McLaren is, is kind of working on the edge of what was possible um, in touching the limits of the state of the art, like it's really going for a, a high um, production value, if, uh, if you want. So it employs a cratophonic sound, and um, on the other, on the other side, that's mostly in the case of High Hirsch, 
it's also touching the limits of what, what was um, technologically possible, but more in like a do-it-yourself and bricolage um, um, kind of tinkering manner. So Hirsch, for example, built uh, an optical printer himself for the montage aspect um, and the combination of, of different images. And um, so space abstraction and sound are now the, the guiding principles. And we'll start with space. And hereby, I mean um, stereoscopics. So it's a 3D film. And also, it's a multi-channel sound space that is being built by that film. It's by Norman McLaren, with assistance by Evelyn Lombard, Chester Bielchel, and many others. And the occasion for the production of Around is Around was the Festival of Britain. And that happened 1951 in London. In London. And for this festival, they, um, they built a whole structure, um, the, the telekinema it was called. It was very elaborate and it, it kind of, I mean, this whole event was kind of meant to, to reassure um, the nation to, to obtain um, national self-assurance after the dismantling of the British Empire following up the Second World War. And um, Canada was, or is, a member of the Commonwealth. And so the festival included contributions also by the National Film Board of Canada. And so um, the two films for the Festival of Britain um, that Norma McLaren and Evelyn Lombard were responsible for were um, Around is Around, and the second one that was called um, Now is the Time to Put on Your Glasses, uh, which served as a prompt to put on polarized glasses. And um, both films employed polarization stereoscopics. So they were part of a larger program, a 3D program that was screened at that telekinema. And um, this 3D program was kind of, and that's also quite interesting, in the forefront of the early 1950s 3D boom, so it might have helped trigger it. Um, and what is also important to add here is that the vast majority of stereoscopic films were and are produced by recording live action by the use of a special camera rig. And here we see two examples. The left one got patented under the name Natural Vision, and it had two objectives separated at the distance between the eyes, so that's um, approximately two and a half inches. And um, then it used a 45 degree mirror and 35 millimeter film, whereas this um, eight millimeter system shown on the right um, it's, it's quite simple. It had two cameras placed next to, next to each other at eye distance. So what is possible with these um, rigs is basically filming objects in their spatial setting as they would appear to our perceptual system and reproducing this by employing two projectors um, at the according distance of two and a half inches. And Norman McLaren did not use this kind of stereo camera rig. Instead, he drew two separate pictures each corresponding to one eye. And these are drawings from the mid-1940s, which was at the peak of his interest in stereo painting and stereo drawing. So a quick biographical note on him. He's from Scotland, where he studied at the Glasgow School of Art. And then in the second half of the 30s, he worked at the General Post Office Film Unit in London. And at the onset of the Second World War, McLaren emigrated to New York, and two years later, in 1941, he moved to Ottawa in Canada. And there he worked for the National Film Board of Canada until shortly before passing away in 1987. And uh, Raymond Spottiswood, who was in Ottawa during the NFP's founding years, uh, remained in contact with McLaren during the time after, and he was responsible for the telekinema stereoscopic film program and commissioned McLaren. And McLaren possibly would otherwise not have picked up his interest in stereoscopics again, and it might not have happened. So um, he um, also then required the help by Chester Biachel, who we see here on the right side. And he was a sound engineer working in the, at the technical division of the National Film Board. 
and he helped McLaren meet the tight deadline of the, the Festival of Britain by coming up with a, this quick method of generating imagery that was appropriate for the stereoscopic effect. So he was the one contributing the oscillographic curves to the film around his round. Um, and here he, he works um, something with the oscilloscope in front of him, and that's the oscilloscope that was also, it's a Dumont lab scope from the 1940s that got used for the film production. Um, the oscillos oscillographics were appropriate for the stereoscopic film because the film was animated, um, not shot using a 3D camera rig. And McLaren and BHL published an article on the topic in the same year the film was made, 1951, and here we see an excerpt from that article. Um, the, the title is already telling, it kind of sums up the whole paper. It's called Stereographic Animation, the Synthesis of Stereoscopic Depth from Flat Drawings and Artwork. And uh, these illustrations show the principle of stereoscopics during the reception of a movie. So I think it's quite clear that um, when you look at the first figure on the left, it's the standard situation when you watch a flat film. And the second one shows um, the possibility of aligning the left eye and the right eye picture in a way so that the viewer stares into infinity, whereas the third option has the eyeballs focus at a point between the screen and the viewer, where then the image would appear to hover, and that is the intended effect that you would want. Um, and the authors of the paper suggest these effects for synthesizing spatially approaching or receding imagery without using a camera rig. So you get kind of the full control of where an image sits um, and which plane it sits between these two points on the screen and in front of your nose. And the authors call one of the many techniques for achieving this frame stagger. And um, frame stagger is simply describing yeah, the staggering of two or three frames. Um, so the, the lag or a constant delay in the presentation of the second film reel in relation to a first reel. And both reels hold the exact same film. And this technique of frame stagger makes it necessary to mostly use sideways rotation because our eyes are positioned horizontally. So a staggered vertical rotation viewed through polarized glasses would produce a strain on the eye. So you, you really want to go with horizontal rotation. So therefore, the authors of the film, McLaren, Lombard, Biachel, chose figures moving in horizontal rotation. Um, yeah, what is more appropriate for that than the oscilloscope? It was the chosen tool. Um, when you have out of phase Lezajou curves, as we see one here on the right side, you get exactly the desired effect. Um, the perceived spatiality adds to it. So it's kind of two um, things combined here. The, um, the, the, the perceived spatiality, what McLaren called dynamic foreshortening, when you have an out of phase Lezajou curve combined with the, the frame stagger method for synthesizing depth. But still, there were many problems. And so in a letter to Ben Leposky, so they were also all in touch and, and talking about the different techniques, um, McLaren writes, uh, many mobile patterns were rejected because of their unsuitability for converting into 3D. Another way how um, around is around addressed space is the quadraphonic soundtrack. The film music was composed by Louis Applebaum. He was one of the NFB's in-house composers and um, Applebaum produced the music for this film and it then got uh, re-recorded on four separate magnetic soundtracks in the space of the film exhibition, so in the telekinema. Um, unfortunately, this um, spatiality of both the sound and the image um, kind of, is, yeah, we cannot perceive it here tonight. Um, I'm going to show you the film now, so maybe we can turn off the lights.